Okay. We had to do one there for the... Uh, had to do one there for the old, uh, the old internets. The old internets, as they say. I don't know what's going on with the old internets. What's up with the old internets? I don't know. What is up with the old internets? We'll figure it out. We're going to get Jaybird Wells back on the line here in just a few seconds, but we have to get a hold of Mr. Randy. Mr. Randy! There used to be a guy here in Hutch who I used to make fun of with the name Randy. I think he moved to Salina. He was a failed administrator at a, at a theater here in town. I love that. There's Randy. There's Randy. How are you, sir? It's James Lowe from iHeartRadio in the mix. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing, James? Pretty good, actually. Let me uh, grab our co-host here. Jaybird Wells, we're going to bring her in on the old Skype audio here in just a few seconds. And uh, Randy Weir is going to join us here in just a few seconds. We are uh, getting everybody all queued up here so we can uh, get this rock and roll party off and running, I guess. I don't know. I, 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 it is a party, I guess, already. We've got uh, Randy Weir with us today. He's a fictional crime writer. He's a well-known novelist, and he's the author of the Jarvis Man Detective Series. And uh, he's with us today here on our big broadcast. And uh, Randy is an independent writer. He's a fascinating storyteller, fictional novelist, and a best-selling author. And his website is rweir.net. Or you can find him on Amazon as well. And uh, we recently had Randy on our um, broadcast, and we were talking a little bit about uh, writing. And I wanted to get him on today to uh, do a uh, author-to-author talk, I guess, with uh, our own Jay Bird Wells. And um, when characters come to life is what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, writing a legendary story is not easy. The premise has to be on point. The plot, the subplots, they need to be seamlessly weaved in. And a cast of characters need to jump off the page as if the account is not of ink and paper, but of flesh and blood and their real-life story. Certain techniques are required to will our characters to life. We need to draw on the unconscious memory and the imagination until our characters begin to act of their own accord. And one of the first steps to character creation and uh with us today of course is randy weir and um randy first of all um tell us a little bit about how we create a fictional character we have a lot of writers in our audience sure well i uh spend uh, a lot of time thinking over characters when i uh, begin begin the process. But the biggest thing is that that main character uh, in in my book and in my books uh, are a series. So I have a main character, Jarvis Man, and I try to make him very flesh and blood, very human, uh, not over the top. He bleeds. He uh, he he laughs uh, occasionally. He has some tears. Um, he's sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's very sarcastic. Yes, he he's got a he's got a sense of humor, and when he's in those tough situations where, uh, when uh, someone's pointing a gun at him or whatever, he uses humor to try to face off to that situation instead of maybe facing those fears. That's his way of uh, dealing with it. So, yes, he's 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 very flesh and blood. He's he's uh, you know he's not very good in his uh, relationships. He has a lot of up and down relationships with women. Uh, he's gotten himself involved with women that he really shouldn't get involved with, uh, letting letting him, letting uh, instead of his brain make the decisions, uh, other things. So that, that's the biggest thing. And then all those other characters uh, around him are always very important, and I try to vary those quite a bit. You know, he deals with, obviously, a lot of bad guys, and, and he deals with good guys as well, and they need to be very multidimensional as well. Uh, they, they, they need to be real people. You know, even the bad guys, uh, they're, they're, they're not uh, cartoonish where, you know, they're just totally evil, uh, though they, some of them are pretty close. Uh, but they have uh, families as well, and, 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 and all those things like a real person has. Uh, and I, I, I try to build on all those things. And it's, it's been a series, so all this stuff kind of builds throughout all the books. Um, 
uh, for that main character and even some of the uh, uh, other characters that uh, show up throughout the, the various books. Am I seeing some uh, uh, first person in your book? Yes. My books uh, are all basically all first person. Uh, the newest book, I do some third person where it's where it's seeing what the serial killer is doing and some of his victims and stuff. But basically it's all it's the old kind of old style, uh, hard boiled nor detective. It's through his eyes, everything it's through his. So everybody thinks that I'm Jarvis Mann. Everybody asks me, is Jarvis Mann you? And and some aspects of him are like me and there's a lot of things about him that are not me. I wish I was as brave as he was at times, uh, dealing with stuff. So uh, I hope, thankfully, I've never had to deal with some of the things he's had to deal with. We've got Randy Weir with us today. He joins us live, and uh, we are talking about uh, when characters come to life. And uh, we're doing a uh, author to author segment here on our big broadcast. We've got our uh, good buddy Jay Bird Wells with us today. She's best selling author, and of course, uh, Randy Weir is also a best selling author. And uh, the uh, the concept for uh, his his soon to be released the front range butcher a Jarvis man detective novel is uh, part of our discussion today about when characters come to life. Now, um, R- Randy, how is uh, your how is your character named and inserted into a story? I know that that is uh, very important. Uh, Jay has talked about that in many mm-hmm. Comic Cons mm-hmm. that she's attended and has spoken at. Uh, give us your view on this. How is how is a character named and inserted into a story? Tell us about the importance of that. Well, I, I know for for me, I, I I looked and thought a lot about the main character, Jarvis Mann, and a lot of people <laughs> even think that he is he English, but he's actually named after. Uh, a family member who from from the past, basically long man. But I, I kind of thought about Jarvis. I, you know, I was trying to come up with a good first name. You know, a lot of te- a lot of detectives sometimes go by a single name. You know, if you if you read the Robert B. Parker Spencer, nobody has ever learned what his real first name is. It's just Spencer. Uh, but I, I decided Jarvis Man, and I thought Man with two ends made sense. You know, because he's he's a, he's a flesh and blood man. That, that seemed to work well, and then yeah, the other the other characters uh, like in my serial uh, latest book, um, uh, the Front Range Butcher, the uh, person who he believes is the serial killer is named Simon Lyons. You know, Lyon. You know, kind of worked right. You know, it's kind of sounded like a last name of a of a serial killer. So you you, you kind of try to get those names that. Uh, seem to kind of fit that character, you know, what, what their personality is, and, and um, basically things like that. And so, I, you know, I do spend a lot of time coming up, and of course you gotta, you got to try to come up with some unique names sometimes, even for the, ex, uh, for the uh, third, uh, other characters in the book. Yeah, it seems like um, char- uh, people in the world, the real world, is it seems like a lot of the names people are alike. Uh, a lot of Mike seem to be alike, you know, a lot of James seems to be alike. There seems to be some kind of correlation with a, a, a character's name. Yeah, it, 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 there, it, it does. and it, it always seems to kind of make sense, at least to me, uh, one of the other bad guys in the in the book is is named. He's just known as Wolf. You know, he's kind of a an assassin, a killer, and that seemed like a good name for that type of character. Not that wolves are necessarily bad in in the world. You know, uh, my wife's a big wolf fan, but that seemed like a great name uh, for 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 a killer. And then you know, uh, Jarvis also has a, a a helper in the book, and he's been in a couple of other books. And his, his, he's only known as Rocky, and we find out that his, his, his name, Rocky, is, and he's a big, kind of a hulking kind of guy, so Rocky kind of works. But that's not really his name, and he's taken that name for another, and I'll do, I won't do any spoilers, but he's taken that name from an incident that's happened in his life. And his real name is something very plain, you know, it's not really his, uh, 
uh, doesn't really fit him as well. Rocky kind of fits him better, but he's actually gone to that name for a different reason. And, uh, yeah, those are, I think those all stand out for readers. Um, obviously, you can't have, you know, too many uh, people with the same same name and the same personalities, or they kind of all run together in the book, and people can't distinguish, well, gee, I thought that was this guy, and it's not. It really isn't this guy. It's that guy. So you have to have those distinctions, or people will get confused when they're reading. And you don't want them to do that. We've got. Yeah, you want your characters yes. to be believable. You you want your readers to to laugh when they laugh and cry when they cry and and yeah, bleed right. when they, they bleed. They need, yeah, they, you want them to feel those emotions. I know when I read through this last book, and this is a, this is a, the longest, most complicated story I've had, uh, Front Range Butcher. Uh, I know when I because you reread it many times as a writer because you're editing and you're constantly rewriting and going back through and, you know, fixing things and, and straightening out storylines. I know when I did that final read-through, I know for me, um, I, was, I, I was captured by what, what was written as well. I, I was engrossed in, in how the story evolved and, and worked. So, uh, as, as I've said, and in, in some, some of the reviewers have said on the book, um, there was never a dull moment in the book. I... I uh, people are not going to want to put the book down, I hope. I th think they're going to read it, and they're going to be uh, reading through and, and, and try to get through those 400 pages in one sitting, which is pretty hard to do unless you're a speed reader, but that's yeah, I hope that they can finish it in a day or two. I was stalking your pages and was able to get one of your first books for free, and uh, I was starting to read it, and I couldn't stop. Great. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Then... Yeah. We were, you were on the phone, so I had to sit there and stop reading. <laughs> <laughs> Randy yeah. Weir with us today. He joins us live here in our broadcast, and uh, he is uh, pretty amazing. He is a, a, a great writer, and um, uh, kind of educate us here on, on, on your background and how you got into the, the world of writing. Well, I've... Uh... I've been writing since a teenager, and I'm in my late 50s now, so um, as, as I've said many times, when I was a teenager, I wrote poetry, and, and uh, I, I started to write some short stories and things, and, uh, you know, I dealt, dealt with teenage angst. That's how, you know, when, I, when life wasn't going well, you wrote it down on a piece of paper. Now, now that I'm getting into middle age, I'm deal dealing with the middle-aged angst and how I write, but uh, the very first... Uh, book that I did in the Jarvis Mann series, A Case of the Mission Bubblegum Card. Um, I wrote it about 20-some years ago, way before the days of independent publishing. And about four or five years ago, I revisited it and I updated it. And, you know, when independent publishing became more popular and I decided to publish it, I had some beta readers that were helping me with it. And they said, you know, this would really make a great series. This detective, he's got a lot of personality and he's He's, he's a little different, and so then I kind of went off into into that. And I actually had written three novels years and years and years ago, which were never published. And one of these days, I hope to go back and maybe update those. They're thrillers. They're you know spy type of books, and they would need to be updated since they were written so long ago. The politics and everything have changed so much, but. Um, I, I wrote those, and I, th I sat down, and I said, well, I had another basic idea for the detective, and that became the second book, which was Tracking a Shadow. And, um, and, and I just, it just evolved from there. And it, 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 the, the, the images are always in your head as a writer, and a lot of times you have to get them out of your head on a piece of paper. You, you just write them down on, or, you know, on your computer these days. The old days, it would have been a typewriter. But you, you just need to get those images out of your head on, on paper, and then they're gone. They're, they're out of your head. Sometimes they kind of haunt you a little bit. I often wondered uh, how Stephen King sleeps at night writing some of the stuff he writes. <laughs> no you know, those images, it's like those, those images that are in his head, well, maybe that's his therapy is to get them down on paper, and then they're gone and out. And that seems to work for me. In this book, this last book, there was a lot of that. I did a lot of serial killer research. Unfortunately, there's a lot of research you can do on serial killers in the world, and it's a little, little frightening and haunting 
of those personalities. But I wanted to get that and then mold this character using some of that, but giving him his own unique uh, uh, features as well. And uh, I had a few sleepless nights while I was writing this book, but once I got it all down, it's out of my head, and it doesn't bother me, and I'm on to the next book. Awesome stuff. We've got Randy Weir with us today. He joins us live here on our program. And uh, uh, Jay, do you have any questions for Randy as a uh, as a writer? I guess the n this is like not an author question. This is just like, how do you write about serial killers? I mean, it's like there's certain songs and, and certain stuff that I don't let my kids listen to because it seems like it's glorifying serial killers, which gives somebody else a reason to become a serial killer. So how do you write about serial killers without glorifying them? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it glorifies them. I think it hopefully it horrifies. I mean, it scares people just like anything else. You see that there are people like this, uh, like that in this world. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the business. The idea is to identify them, obviously, and you know, take action, put them away. Whatever. In this case, this serial killer was from 20 some years ago, and he stopped. And then now he's back. They never caught who he was. You know, it's kind of like Jack the Ripper. You know, Jack the Ripper, you know, years and years and years ago, uh, disappeared and never came back. Well, this 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 killer has returned, and he's uh, killing again. Uh, unfortunately, he's he's very smart, um, very elusive. And the man who they think is the new cur the, the, who's now starting the killings now, uh, and they think was the one from before, he's actually in a wheelchair now. So it's a matter of is he is he faking it? Is he whatever? But I I think it's it's it, it it's one of those stories where it needs to be told um, that there are people in this world like that, and there are good people out there to stop bad people. And that's, you know, that's, that's kind of the basic storyline of most of these type of books, is those, those bad people will get their comeuppance in the end. That's what you hope. And that's, that's, uh, tried. So, and in you this case, it's kind of a psych psychological battle of wills between mm -hmm. the good guy and the bad guy to see who can, who can, come out in the end victorious. You, and, and unfortunately, mean, yeah. for... Go ahead. Sorry, I keep interrupting. Yeah. I, I was just going to be a smart ass. You mean you can't just ban evil and evil goes away? You mean it takes a good guy <laughs> with the same tool to fight a bad guy with the same tool? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I th I'm afraid there's going to always be bad guys in the world. And I wish that wasn't the case. I wish... I wish uh, everything was nice, and, and there was uh, no no evil, and, and people weren't on, out on the streets starving, and you know all those things. Unfortunately, that's unfortunately that's the way the world is. And in the end, you hope that you, the conclusion will be uh, one where good tri triumphs over evil. Uh, unfortunately, there's always a cost, and 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 for my uh, uh, protagonist. There is a cost involved. He he, he does he does, uh, and, and and there's always a cost for good. You know, obviously, uh, our soldiers who go off to war and fight, you know, many of them come home damaged, and, and it's those things are it's a shame that that happens, and it, it, we need it to happen, in that, or need that has to happen in this world. But yeah, that's but they that's, don't that's need experiment. Less, uh, on our soldiers and dope them up with a whole bunch of drugs that they come home with and have a whole bunch of problems from it. Yeah, no, we don't. We, I, I, we definitely don't want that to happen to those uh, young men who go off and not trying to turn us into any kind of political thing. But yeah, those, those are the, unfortunately, those are the bad, bad things. There's the bad and there's the good in the world and, and. Uh, and I think the biggest thing for this is that personality clash between Jarvis and the man who he thinks is a serial killer. And, and there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one between those two. Um, and 
each trying to outthink the other. And uh, I think that, that, that builds a lot of tension in the book. That, so uh, if uh, it's compelling. If corrupted children watch uh, Die Hard and Deadpool, can they read your series? <laughs> um, my series, the first book is very uh, young adult. There's no bad language or anything in it. Uh, the case of the missing bubblegum card. Uh, the rest of the books, I've had 16-year-olds and older read them and um, with no, no real problems. Obviously, there is language. And, I, and I, when I do book events, you know, the parents come up and I ask how old their kid is. And I say, well, you know, there is this, there's language, and there is some sexual content in the books. Um, you know, are you okay with them reading it? You know, I, I, I tell them that. It's, they're, they're more adult books, but, old, you know, a lot of teenagers today, you know, when I was a teenager, there was no way I would have read a book like that. These days, you know, it's, it's not as... Uh, now, it doesn't, doesn't shock parents and it doesn't shock uh, uh, kids to read some of, the, some of the content in it. So I think it's a matter of, uh, of the child and, you know, how advanced they are and, and what type of stuff they read um, you know, or what they watch on TV as well. So, In other words, the parent child, knows the kid. I think the parent knows, knows the child. Like my I child, mean, I, you oh. know, she, 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 she reads a lot of Dysphonia stuff. And you know she's 18 now, so she can she can pretty much decide what she wants to read. But uh, when she was younger, you know, I told her this book's probably not quite for you yet. When you get older and you want to read it, yeah. When you're 18 and older, yeah. Uh, but there are plenty of 16 year olds that read it, and I've had parents who've read it, and you know they say the story is great, and I want my I want my child to read it because I think the, that's great. And of course, I think it's always a good thing when children read. Hopefully they read, you know, start out with stuff for their age, but, you know, reading is a very important aspect and, and gets lost in this television video game world that we're in. And, and I know my daughter reads constantly, and which I, I think is great. And she likes to write, too, so maybe someday there'll be another generation of a weir out there writing. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yes. We've got uh, Randy Weir with us today. Uh, if people want to find you on social media or pick up your books, how do they do that exactly? Sure. Uh, well, I'm on Facebook. Uh, it's under Randy Weir. Uh, my books are under R. Weir. That's a, a, a very basic pseudonym, but I didn't want to put my whole, whole name on the book, so I just go by R. Weir. Uh, but I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can find my profile on there, author Randy Weir. Um, Amazon, most of my books are on Amazon. The first three books in the series are also on all other e ebook retailers. So Apple, uh, Barnes & Noble, all of them. And then, like I said, I'm on Amazon. And then my website is rweir.net, rweir.net. Uh, very basic, and you can uh, go there, and there's places to connect. And I do give uh, the first uh, ebook, The Case of Missing Bubblegum Card, it's free across all retailers, so anyone can always check out that book for free. And if you sign up for my newsletter, you can get the second novel for free uh, through my rweir.net uh, website, the tra uh, Tracking a Shadow. I'll give them that book for free as well, and then hopefully they'll buy the rest of the series. And there are seven in all so, so far. Wow. I'm working on number eight not right now. That's fantastic. Yeah, crap, I just sat there and un undid the... Now i got to get back to his website. <laughs> it is uh, It is a <laughs> fun, fun interview. Randy, we're with us today. And uh, Randy, thanks for coming on and uh, chatting with me and Jay. It's definitely been a, uh, a fun interview, and we hope to do it more down the road, my friend. Thanks for being 